This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Thursday, March 7th of 2019, it's episode 148. In this episode, Angels in Our Games, plus advice for running convention games, conventions we're going to in 2019, Archons in the Outfield and Barbarian Tony Danza, a quick theology break to talk about Guardian Angels, and more. Welcome to Saving the Game. I'm Grant. I'm Peter. And I'm Jenny. How's everybody doing? Uh, oh, man. Uh, so it's about to be March break. Okay. And so that's literally probably, I think it's probably the busiest time of the year for the library because I've got to have programs for kids that aren't going to, you know, the Dominican Republic or whatever, um, which is apparently the hot new vacation spot. Like I've talked to about five kids who are all going to the Domi- to the Dominican Republic this year for some reason. But yeah, so I've I've got to prep for just so many kids making so many bath bombs, playing so many magic cards, and making so many snow castles. Okay. It's going to be awful. My denomination's going to schism, probably, and my wife is on antibiotics for a cat bite. So that's the kind oh. of week I've been having. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mine's been <sighs> up and down. Probably yeah. like most people's, frankly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we do have a bit of news. Yeah, if if all goes well, uh, I will be going to GaryCon this weekend. Um, I'm not sure how much of the convention I'm going to make it to, but it's close enough where I can just kind of drive up there when I'm ready and drive back when I'm done. So that's nice. Unless something catastrophic happens, I will definitely be doing the breakfast with the chaplain on Sunday morning because Derek White, who you've heard on this show a few times, is said chaplain. And Tim Decker, Daniel Fisher, and Jeff Romo, who you may know from guest appearances on this show, and in Tim's case, and Inroads Ministries in Daniel and Jeff's case, will also be there. So I will finally get to put names with faces and shake some hands of people that I have only interacted with online. So, and I know there are some folks from the Christian Gamers Guild who are going to be there as well. Yeah, I don't know those folks as well, but I'll be happy to make their acquaintance, that's for sure. Yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah. It should be a nice time. It'll be good. Relatedly, I'm going to a convention. This is Con Carolinas, uh, May 31st to June 2nd in Charlotte, North Carolina. So, you know, if anybody else is going, plan to say hi. A few folks I know will be there. Uh, Mikey Mason's going to be performing, which is always fun. I encourage you to look up Mikey Mason, but be aware he's very not safe for work geek humor. Really good, but, you know, FYI. Cool guy, but definitely not safe for work stuff. I'm trying to get signed up for gaming, but their gaming system is like this weird process where you send stuff in, activate account, and then wait for people to manually link your con account with the game registration account and... I don't know. Yikes. It seems needlessly Byzantine. Well, and I thought Can Games is, was weird. Can Games is also weird. Yeah, it's... Look, this is a, a long-running con, and, you know, they've changed a bunch of stuff, I'm sure, and who knows? I, I don't know. I know it's the same folks that do the gaming at, I think, Mace? Hey, if it works out in the end, it's fine. It's just, wow, that's that seems very involved. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is, but it's, I got a few months to sort that out, you know? Yeah. At any rate, I'm excited about that. That'll be fun. And I do want to thank all of our Patreon supporters for making those con appearances a whole lot easier. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's been a big help to be able to just say, yeah, we can we can register for that con, no problem. And for the record, yeah. we're looking for one to get Jenny to. So, yeah, there's a couple that happen in my area. There's actually one that's probably going to be happening like the weekend that this drops that I may go to. It's sort of a convention, but not really. It's the Ottawa Geek Market. Hmm. I may or may not be at that. Okay. We'll see. I mean, for what it's worth, you're actually, you've got a better record of con attendance than we do since starting on the podcast. (laughs) So (laughs) Grant and I occasionally make one a year and Jenny's like, so for my fourth con this year. (laughs) Now, now, okay, that that is not going to be happening this year. This this year, I'm basically going to get like one convention. That's it. Uh, the, The job makes most convention attendance very difficult because- Conventions happen at like peak season for us, so mm. it's it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, th- this is the first con I've been to in years. So was the last one that you went to the Fear the Con that we were both at? Or yeah, wow. Well, well then. you've been <laughs> some smaller like geek stuff around 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, then, haven't yeah. you like library stuff? Yeah, there's the library so. convention as well, but that's like a little one day mini con. I should add Electric City Comic Con to that, but like traveling to a full on, you know, large scale convention with gaming and lots of other activities, it's been a long time. So I'm excited. Yeah, it'll be good. Yeah. Speaking Glad of gaming, going. our gaming has been going reasonably well. I've been having a lot of fun. Good. Yeah, I I definitely enjoy the Eberron game. <laughs> we, we've had the adult schedule conflicts, you know, throughout the campaign as we always do, but it hasn't totally shut it down like it has a couple things in the past, so that's good. Yeah, well, I'm being a little looser with the number of people I permit to be out before I call a game off, so that helps. <laughs> sure. W- which you kind of have to do now that the player group has grown. I mean, it's it's more potential scheduling conflicts, so. Yeah, mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm reasonably happy with the way the the first adventure that we had turned out. Uh, You've all recovered a painting and found some treasure and made payroll. Mm -hmm. Good good stuff. And now... uh, Designed a baby Bjorn. (laughs) Yes. Yes, you did that. I'm actually having a little bit harder of a time, like, getting into the mindset of this particular character than I did with Lambert. So that's been an interesting challenge for me. I mean, I can see that it's, it's a very different character from what you're used to playing. Yeah. It is not Peter in a box. No. <laughs> this character is right on target for me, except a little bit more chaotic. And, and that's about it. <laughs> I, I'm just sort of unleashing myself a little bit more than I generally do. I think actual real world Jenny's a little more good aligned than Canelon is. Oh, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's just a question of, of shifting my focus from like what profits the group to what profits me. And and playing a character like that is a little easier than I thought it would be, but like not without its challenges. I hear that. Yeah. And, you know, we had our second adventure, what, our fourth session, and we finally had somebody die in a D&D game. So, <laughs> I mean, it was an NPC to start off the adventure and yeah. the mystery. But, hey, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Turns out clerics who spend spare the dying on enemies don't have a lot of people die in fights. <laughs> <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> hey, it works. That's what it's there for. Yeah. Nasir is very formidable, but he's not particularly ruthless. Uh, yeah, very true. So yeah, I, I was happy with that. Really happy with how my wife has been playing. She's been doing a lot of really fun stuff in the game too, so. Yeah, mine one is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, actually, I, I think probably like the three players that are not on this podcast are the ones that are having the easiest time with their characters this time around, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Like all three of them seem to have been like, yep, this is what I'm doing. This is all clicking, firing on all cylinders. And Jenny and I are like, I have most of a handle on this person. <laughs> so yeah. Fair. Anyway, shall we do our Patreon question? Yes, let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and roll. And uh, while I get this die ready... Quick reminder, if anybody else wants to get their Patreon questions in, please go ahead and do so. And if you want to start asking questions that aren't already a supporter, go to patreon.com slash saving the game. Sign up. It's only a dollar a month. You can sign up for more. You get more benefits. But dollar a month gets you question asking access and access to our list of show outlines that we always produce, which is always a fun little thing that anybody can look at and something I always forget to let people know about. So, yeah, let's roll this down. You can see just how detailed our outlines are. Yeah. All right. Ooh. All right. So this one is from Paige Lowe. What advice do you have for running a game at a con? Speaking of cons. Uh, keep it short and sweet and sandbox. That That's what I tend to do. There, You could also like go the other route and say that short and sweet, but like really directed to keep players on task. But like I had a heck of a lot of fun doing the arena match. The, the oh, the Deck of Many Things game? <laughs> the Deck of Many Things game was an absolute blast to run. I'm actually thinking of maybe running it for um, a kid that... Uh, hang on a second. Excuse me. I'll deal with the cat. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw her into the void! <sighs> Sorry about that. I'm back. Welcome back. <laughs> no problem. Um, Dang it. Heck, where was I? Short, sweet, sandbox, more directed. Possibly we're arena going to game. start talking about sign, and sign. how that was a little more constrained. Um, yes and no. Like, I didn't. <laughs> I was sort of more the facilitator in sign. I I would say sign was right in the middle between sandbox and constrained. The players definitely had a lot more restrictions on what they couldn't couldn't do, but it wasn't a directed plot. 
as it were. And and some people prefer a directed plot. Uh, another trick that I know is like sort of outline it like like a grade nine essay. Like you have to have the beginning, the middle, and in the middle, there's got to be three points, your standard three point essay, and then the end and sort of structure it like that. Okay, so I've never actually run a con game, but I would say based on what I have played in that's been successful, do something a little bit out there. Sign is not a standard like fantasy LARP. It's it's about, no. you know, the development of language in a school back in the 80s in Nicaragua, which made it really interesting. And mm -hmm. those of us who I don't think anybody walked away from that table in anything less than like, wow, that was a yeah. really amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so glad I signed up for that. But uh <laughs> Con games are the perfect time to do something innovative, interesting, out there or weird. Yeah. Any any kind of experimenting that you want to do. And then I would say just prep until you're confident. Yeah. There are also so sort of along the same lines, there are games out there that are designed specifically for one shots. One of which I'm going to be talking about during this topic, Exodus, which is like designed to be run in two to three hours. Mm -hmm. Sign is also designed to be run in two to three hours. So so look for little indie experimental games like that. They're really good for, for conventions. Yeah, or if you've got something high concept like your Deck of Many Things Battle Royale. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that gets to something that I think is a really good con game. Have a game that you can pitch basically just in the title. Mm -hmm. Deck of Many Things Arena Battle. I'm like 90% already in just from the title. Mm -hmm. One of the best con games I played in was, well, several. The one that comes to mind is the Soul Calibur characters in court-ordered group anger <laughs> management therapy. Ridiculous. I still get a kick out of just like the concept. The concept's so good. Yeah. And it's a simple, easy pitch. Also, mm -hmm. the GM who we've had on the show before, Derek Knudsen, he let me play Voldo, which meant I got to hiss for three hours because <laughs> Voldo only hisses. He doesn't talk. It was great. Anyway, that kind of ridiculousness works really well in a con game. So something that's short and sweet, like you said, a little out there, mm -hmm. which immediately attracts attention. That's a great way to design your game because that also limits your scope. You're not trying to tell a big epic story. You're trying to tell this one weird story. Now, there are games that can work in a, a pretty epic fashion. I was in an incredible fiasco game at Fear the Con that was, you know, a relatively narrow setting, right? It was just this one town kind of on the Texas-Mexico border and cowboy game. Great. But we had this huge dramatic arc and it built up over the course of three hours and was really incredible, but we didn't really set out for that. It just sort of happened. And that's also a GM-less game, which kind of helps. Make it about this one weird thing, this one weird trick to running a good game. And I think you'll find it pretty successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what I've got. Paige, thanks for asking a question. Like I said, anybody else who wants to ask a question, make sure you've got your questions in. We're running short, folks. Get them into us. Email them to us or yeah. submit them through our Patreon. <laughs> ask us weird things. We don't care. We don't care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and do our scripture, shall we? Because we've got a pretty big topic to talk about here. Alrighty. This is Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. This is Numbers 13.33. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Psalm 91, verses 9 through 13. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. And we have Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. And we have Matthew 28, 1 through 7. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were as white as snow. 
The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And Colossians 2, verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. So our topic tonight is angels in gaming, which I can't help but call archons in the outfield because I'm a child of <laughs> 80s and 90s. <laughs> um, oh, oh, come on. You can't see it. <clears throat> Danny Glover is the world wary paladin trying to lead a party. Tony Danza is the half orc barbarian he's always been. D- it doesn't work for you? So, sometime, okay, sometimes you laugh because something is outlandish and sometimes you laugh because it's totally appropriate. Right, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Brenda Fricker, perfect dwarf cleric. She's got this. <laughs> the kid is, I don't know, the annoying half life. Full disclosure, I've never actually seen Angels in the Outfield, so... I've seen, like, the last third of Angels in the Outfield. I've, I've heard enough about it where I almost feel like I've seen it, but I I've never actually seen it. I definitely saw it, like, twice in the Dollar Theater. All right. Yeah. Look, I was of the age. You don't have to justify, man. <laughs> I kind of do. Eh, not really. No, I, I tried to go back and you can't. Well, I've mm. discovered that with many things from my childhood, but that doesn't mean you have to justify doing it in the moment. I mean, you were a kid. No, the shame lingers. No, you you were a kid. <laughs> That's anyway. how that works. That's how time works, Grant. Fair enough. <laughs> Unlike angels in the outfield, there's a certain cool factor to angels. <laughs> And uh, we should talk about <laughs> using them in gaming. We should do that. Yeah. Because we talked about them all last episode, like what they're all about. So now how how do we game this? Exactly. So in case you're coming into this on your first episode, we did a whole thing on the theology of angels in the previous episode. So go back, listen to episode 147, catch up there, and you'll be all prepared for this episode. Just pause it, back up, and then pick right back up here, and you'll be in great shape. All right. So angels, uh, we talked about last time how they are messengers from God. It's how they're used in the Bible. It's how they are in a lot of the scripture we just read, for example. You can certainly use them as messengers in gaming. Mm -hmm. Sure. The standard, hey, don't, don't do this. Right, stay away. So they can be used for like, like heavy GM intervention. Like, hey, players, you're about to do something really awful. (laughs) And we're really like, really out there. Or if you do this, I will not hesitate to, you know... Drop an angel on Go. you. Yeah. Yeah. Hear yeah. ye, players, you are about to do something you cannot take okay. back. So here's what's yeah. funny. I actually kind of disagree because I think that's not necessarily the only way to, to use a don't do this. I think you could do it just Fair. like we did it or just like we saw in Matthew where you have like a dream come to a party See, member. That- for me, that's what I put under do this, which I consider to be standard quest giving. Okay, that's fair. But I think you could also do it as a warning, like, you know, stay away yeah. from this or beware this, right? Kind of a mm-hmm. milder, be careful of this, stay away, look out, rather than, yeah. you know, teriel yeah. descending with wispy Diablo angel wings. Yeah. And then there's also, like, do this, like, please perform this action. Perform this action and the good will happen. You you see this in in the Matthew scripture. You see it in to to a degree in Genesis nineteen, where Lot lets angels into his home. Yeah, and 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 that kind of thing. Like like please do these things, and good will happen. You see it a bit in the um, traveler myth, mm-hmm. like the the hitchhiker myth, which we talked about last episode. Sure, I think sort of related to that. You can also have the. The foretelling, you know, foreshadowing style angel of, hey, this is a thing that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Again, Genesis, angel and the Lord visiting, telling Sarah, hey, you're going to have a son, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. A whole, whole nation will descend from you. You can certainly do that as well. Mm-hmm. I also like the, I, I, I think of the, um, the angel appearing to Mary Magdalene as the, your prince of peace is in another castle. <laughs> okay. One. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love that joke. I've been making it for years. I have no intention of stopping anytime soon. Please don't. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. It's um, me, the angel of the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. That's even better. I like that one better. It is good. I, good. I like Toad, you know, with the the classic book you always see uh, Michael yeah. carrying in, in paintings, that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Descending powerfully. <laughs> and but it's talking toad. like Mario. <laughs> 
Oh. Anyway, um, so your Prince of Peace is in, a, in another castle. It's sort of general statements and gentle guiding. Like, yeah. here's a fact. Do with it what you will. Here's a, a general message. This is what's going to happen. Some questions on this that I, I'd like you to think about if you're going to do this. Is it known to the party that the messenger is an angel? There's always the classic wise, strange person who appears on the road, the traveler archetype, but then maybe they disappear or maybe they just sort of join up with you for a little bit and carry you on. And, oh, look, they were secretly, uh, you know, something powerful in disguise because shapeshifters and whatever. Yeah. You can drastically change the direction of the plot with that, too. Like, if they treat the traveler well, you, you've treated him well, he's going to be nice to you back. But if you treat him terribly... Like the people of Sodom treated the angels terribly. Bad things are going to happen to you. And you can completely, you you could probably hinge a whole plot based on how the party treats a traveler. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. That's actually something I want to point out. You have to make sure if you do this, that these angels in disguise are somehow distinguished from any other powerful shape-shifting creature. Yeah. Yeah. If your story is exactly the same as if it were a dragon or a generically wise farmer, you've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Make it distinct that this is an angel. Like, like there is a specific divine consequence for either action. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. We've talked about this a lot over the years, but you can always use this to sort of replace a pantheon in a multi-theistic setting. Mm -hmm. Oh, all these uh, deities are really <clears throat> angels of the Most High. Right, very classic. Yeah, we, we've talked about just, this with saints. Yeah, you can you can do like um just for those who haven't heard those particular episodes. The the basic idea here is you can kind of take a page from Inamine with the archangels that have specific words, which is something with a dramatic capital on it, where it's basically there's this specific aspect of reality that this particular angel is responsible for mm -hmm. yeah they they are highly specialized individuals yeah um and i mean to give you some examples from inamine you have things like uh war or fire or animals or knowledge or destiny or that sort of thing you can have like an organization that's structured underneath of that where all of the people that are in it are still worshiping the god but the angel is acting as like the upper management mm -hmm. and kind of you know handling the day-to-day -day coordination of things and that sort of thing that's kind of how you can do it without running into the you know the worship of angels problem if that's something yeah. that you specifically want to stay away from in your world design it should also be noted that, like, at, at the very least in my denomination, angels are also patron saints. They are specialized like that in my denomination. I, I talked about this uh, last time with Uriel. Ur Uriel is specializing in poetry and light and the Holy Sacrament of Confirmation. So angels, at least in Anglicanism, are specialized in a similar way to patron saints. Mm -hmm. Being a direct offshoot of Catholicism, like you guys are, without the yeah. Lutheran influence, yeah. lets you keep a lot of the really cool stuff from Catholicism, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it. You get a lot more of it in High Anglican. I am still very low Anglican, but yeah. 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 Another use for angels is allies. And the big question here is, if you say you are on the side of the angels, how much are the angels permitted to interfere and help you? Mm -hmm. How autonomous are they? Are they patrolling the cosmos looking for problems? Or are they working on direct commands from God? Are they bound in some way to only do certain things? How much assistance can you get? Are you going to be, you know, moving an uh, angel mini around on the map to smite your foes? Or is this more in the role of like an advisor, a quest giver, things like that? Yeah. Um, and that sort of takes us to guardians, guardian angels. Which, to a certain degree, we talked about in this episode and last. You can have guardians of a place. Cherubim, of course, are said to be the ones guarding the Garden of Eden. But you can also have guardian angels, which is a term we're all familiar with, but I think a lot of us don't think about it very much, especially not Protestants, because, well, it's not a big deal for most of us. For some it is, but for most, yeah. less so. Quick theology break here. Beliefs in the roles of angels differ between Catholic and Orthodox Christians versus Protestants. Like I said, Protestants generally sort of vaguely accept the guardian angel idea, don't give it a lot of thought, but various church fathers have addressed the topic. And while guardian angels are not a part of Catholic or Orthodox dogma, it's accepted belief that each individual has a guardian angel assigned to them at birth. This is one of those things that is 
and I quote here according to one writer, irrefutably supported by scripture. And indeed, there are numerous verses, even in the Protestant Bible, suggesting, yeah, this is true. So while it's not official doctrine, pretty much all church fathers have agreed on, who at least have written about it. Notably, though, the purpose of this guardian angel is not to protect the person they're guarding from physical harm, but from sin, to help bring them to God. This is kind of the anti-screw tape, as it were. Yes, yeah. exactly. And indeed, if you read the screw tape letters, which I strongly recommend you do because it's excellent oh, yes. and, yeah. uh, to use a very evangelical word, very convicting, it's a really good read. Yeah, it's good for C.S. Lewis, which is really saying something yeah. because most of his stuff is excellent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But like I said, for most Protestants, either we don't give this a lot of thought or we just sort of refer back to pre-Reformation writers for answers, just as Catholics do. Yeah, it should be noted that I, with my weird beliefs in angels, don't think guardian angels are necessarily a thing, as there is very little evidence. And I, I think a lot of other Anglicans are sort of in the same vein as I am. It's 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 not even like a thing that we don't give thought to. It's not exactly a thing at all. Right. I, I think we sort of shy away from it a fair amount because of our very open thoughts on saints and angels. Mm -hmm. And and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's still a very cool plot device. Do it in your games. Yes. It's still very cool. And that brings us back to gaming. What is the role of a guardian angel in this game or setting? Why are they there? What are they protecting you from? That sort of thing. And most importantly, how do you interact with them? Because they have to have some role and be interactable in some way, or there's really no point in even thinking about this question. At least in a gaming context. Right. Yeah. If you're going to introduce this concept in a game, you you know, it's Chekhov's gun. Yeah, use it. Use it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does everyone start with a guardian angel at birth per commonly accepted Christian doctrine, or are they assigned only at certain times to certain people for certain purposes? Is there always just one for a person's entire life, or are they handed off from angel to angel? Do those angels have different protecting styles? Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have ones that are kind of like just guarding you against spiritual threats like we talked about before when we referenced the screw tape letters or you know do you have ones that do that and also like try and keep you away from physical hazards or bad relationships or poor financial decisions i mean <laughs> you know if you get one that's really like obsessive does it become obnoxious yeah you know think about that stuff what happens if you lose a guardian angel can you get it back do you get assigned a different one i think whose angel did you take I yeah. think an interesting mechanic for this in in the um, Monster of the Week powered by the Apocalypse game, mm -hmm. there's a, a mechanic called luck. I think it would be really interesting to have a guardian angel kind of thing where you can use sort of luck or you have guardian angel points and you can use those points to invoke or summon your guardian angel to help you out with a task or or guard you from something. But once you have run out of guardian angel points, you have lost your guardian angel privileges. <laughs> and and uh you you can't get those back. Yeah. Uh in in Monster of the Week. You may be able to if if this kind of mechanic were applied to a, a different game or something like that, but I think that could be really interesting. Like, oh, oh, like you have to <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of awful, maybe not so angelic, but like you have to do favors for the angel or or tasks for the angel in order to get your guardian angel points back. See, and the thing that immediately came to my mind is having somebody who's skeptical of this whole thing witness their guardian angel getting killed in action, saving them from something. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> it's like, OK, so now you've got a character moment. What do you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so another take on this. Angels as sort of the instruments of divine wrath. We see this if a couple of times here and there in scripture. And of course- The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the the standing army of good that you sort of see in Revelation. And you sort of have this as a base assumption in certain types of D&D-like uh, &D games, your classic fantasy stuff. You know, if that's a the case develop that a little bit is there you know some big angelic army out there are they engaged in individual battles so on and so forth in eberron you know there's a couple of different angels or angelic societies on a couple of different planes but they all serve wildly different purposes because eberron is weird what's that about there is a literal army of angels on a plane that's devoted entirely to war and chaos that's one of the three sides that's fighting yeah mm -hmm. it's a weird setting 
And speaking of weird settings, are angels a sort of cosmic maintenance staff? You know, like we were talking about the spheres of angels that uh, Pseudo Dionysius laid out last episode. Are the ones in charge of creation and making sure creation runs orderly? Are they angels you can go talk to, interact with? If this is a nobilis style game where you're talking to the spirits of things, are you talking to the angel in charge of that tree? Or what kind of a conversation would you have with the one in charge of magnetism? Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, what would Magnus, that be like? How do they work? <laughs> the angel is like, well, pull up a chair. We're going to be here for 17 hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to know more about this than you ever wanted to. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it starts off quoting Carl Sagan. Well, to make an apple pie, if you want to create an apple pie first, create a universe. <laughs> this is also a really good place for those weird eldritch depictions, like you said. Um, mm -hmm. You can also play angels, of course, or at least an angel-related characters. Yeah. This is where I, I swoop in and talk about Exodus, which I'm so very excited about. Unfortunately, the Kickstarter is over, but you can still buy the, the PDF for like, I think it's $7, something like that for the PDF. Huh. And so Exodus uses the belonging outside belonging system by Avery Alder, who is known for Monster Hearts and um, The Quiet Year and all sorts of games along those lines. Belonging Outside Belonging is completely diceless and GMless, and it's very much driven by player choice. And you play angels that have been cast out from a fascist dystopia. And there's seven different types of angels that you can play. They're called different playbooks. So you can play the artist, you can play you can play a guardian angel. And the system is light enough that you could probably homebrew your own playbooks fairly easily if if you're game design oriented in the least. Um, I'm very, very excited to play this one at some point. Yeah. Uh, if um, anybody wants to get a so cool. sample of this, I'm also going to put a link in the show notes to uh, Jeff Stormer's Party of One podcast, which did an episode recently of Exodus with Erica Shepard. Hmm. Party of One is actually a pretty neat podcast because it's one-on-one -on -one gaming, one-on-one yeah. -on -one role playing, which is always a very interesting dynamic, right? It's much more personal. Uh, but this is a really good actual play of the game. It's about an hour and a half long, and mm -hmm. Erica's a very cool player. So, yeah. I mean, she she designed the thing, so I should hope she's... Yeah. Um, yeah. But like I'm saying, you know, it, the, the dynamic there is neat. Mm -hmm. So this is, speaking of swooping in, this is where I swoop in and talk about Inamine, which is... <laughs> you can definitely play angels. You can also play demons or dream spirits or mortal agents of heaven and hell. Um, there's such a dizzying variety of different PC types available in Anamine that the books actually recommend restricting the PC group to one type of being or at least a single side for that reason. So you can play like angels and they're called soldiers of heaven but it's probably not a great idea to try and work like hey we've got an angel and we've got a march's spirit and we've got a you know a demon and a, a renegade yeah, no yeah. yeah it's like mm, mm, your your game is gonna fall over catch on fire and then sink into the swamp like the castle and holy grail but yeah there's there's a lot of different ones in there there's uh, seven or eight different varieties of angel and then each one of the archangels kind of puts their own gloss on the angels that serve them. So if you've got um, a seraphim that is in service to war, they're going to be very different than one that is in service to flowers because that's a very peaceful archangel and <laughs> they're not going to be all about the fightiness like the one that's serving Michael will be. So yeah, yeah there's, it's definitely, it's, it's an interesting game. It's got one of the more interesting like dice systems that's out there too, which I kind of like, but it's not really being supported anymore. They kind of released stuff for a couple of years and then stopped. Yeah. So I was able to find a PDF copy of it, but I've, I, I don't think I've ever even seen a print copy. I, I don't know think if they exist. I actually have every single non-deluxe book that was ever released for it in print. Huh. All right. Okay, then. then. It takes up about a foot and a half on my bookshelf. <laughs> Ooh, okay. <clears throat> well, so in response, this is where I swoop in and talk about D&D. &D. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Swooping. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, so there are games that like D&D &D, that lets you at least play in that space somewhat. So uh, Dungeons and Dragons for a while, at least since the, at least since third edition and maybe before had uh, Asimar, 
uh, which are, you know, half angel people, basically, or people whose bloodline can be traced back to a celestial or you know, an angel, basically, in D&D. Yeah, there's three different varieties of them in 5e. Yeah, there are. One of which, though, I mean, they're kind of cheating because that's a fallen one. Yeah. Yeah. Although anybody who's a fan of Critical Role might fight you over that. Yasha's very popular. Uh, okay, cool. Dang it, spoilers, heck! I should listen to that. Come on! I'll listen to that at some point. Okay. But that's certainly a thing. And, you know, earlier editions, I certainly remember at least that Asimar in 3.5 had a level adjustment of plus one. I remember that much. And yeah, Dark Vision. I remember they were super OP. And th- that was one of the few restrictions my group had. No one was allowed to play Asimar in my group. Ah, uh, you know, I think only because they had improved initiative. Everything else is fine. I feel I, like. I, I know. I'm remembering Multiple some stat way- bonuses with no penalties. Um, they were the outsider type, which gave you a bunch of yeah, benefits. outsider's always nice. You're right. Uh, yeah, they probably deserved a plus yeah. two, but all right. Fair enough. They're great in 5e, though. They're they're oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, they've got like that built-in angelic guide, which is kind of cool. That's good. Uh, but anyway, that's a thing that certainly exists. And the idea of playing somebody who can trace their lineage back to that is pretty neat. Sort of harkens back to the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of stories in Judaic tradition about the Nephilim, but there's not a great deal in a lot of the direct scripture that's actually out there or the the stuff certainly that has come down into the Christian traditions. I think we read most of it at the top of the episode. yeah. Yeah, there's basically two that are confirmed Nephilim. Other times it's hard because the the Jewish alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, doesn't have vowels. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the, translating ancient language is hard. So they're either giants or they're people who cause other people to fall or they're fallen angels or they're the kids of fallen angels. We just don't know. We don't know. Exactly. But yeah, the, the giant thing, I've actually heard people say that um, Goliath was supposed to be one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard that as well. But yeah, this is something that is certainly present in uh, Christian tradition. And if you talk about the Nephilim, a little bit of reading will get you a lot of interesting ideas. And of course, you can have a celestial patron. Yo, this this is is Peter's in my territory. Mm -hmm. Because we have been wanting to play our celestial patron warlocks. For, for over a year now, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's you had to move to time. Scotland, didn't you, Mowers? Uh-huh. So- <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're proud of you and all, but we want to play these characters, man. We want to play these really cool celestial patron warlocks who have a patron that looks like a unicorn. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's a legit thing that you can get with a celestial yep. patron. I was so happy when I saw that. That's in Xanathar's, right? Yep. Yeah. When I saw that in Xanathar's... I was just overjoyed, and I could just have a unicorn patron. That's really cool, because unicorns are sort of considered celestial in D&D, and that's really cool. So I think it's also a good workaround or alternative to the regular warlock background thing for those who aren't super comfortable with- Or even just super interested in a more sinister yeah. patron. Yeah, yeah. But the Celestial Patron, there is a specific D&D 5e specialization for the Warlock class, but I think the general idea of you are working for an angel or you are working for a celestial being can be applied to a lot of different games and even genres. Like, you, you can go monster hunting kind of thing, but you are working for angels. You can go... I, I You know what? I bet you I could work this into Shadowrun somehow. Oh, I'm sure. And yeah, G- give me I a bit a, of time and I can work it in listen, the shadow. Room. I, I have absolutely done, you know, the Santa saves Christmas kind of thing, which is <laughs> Santa is a powerful spirit in Shadowrun who has hired the party to help him save Christmas, usually yeah. with machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Or in, uh, you also did that with a Russian troll that was a weapons dealer. I but did. But the other we, option told was that story. You know, Santa <laughs> hires you to um, deliver gifts to a particular corporate enclave that's heavily locked down. <laughs> you have to sneak in or, you know, burst your way in and deliver gifts to all the uh, all the little corporate apartments. <laughs> <laughs> I, speaking of the celestial patron stuff, I also had one. I've, I want to play this character someday, but Eberron didn't seem like the right place to do it, where 
somebody who didn't lead a particularly virtuous life through a lot of like horrible circumstance dies and is kind of given a second chance and comes back as an Asimar with a celestial patron that they're directly working for and acts as kind of a mentor figure to try and get them like onto the path of redemption, like wakes up in a crater, very confused kind of a thing. Hmm. I've been wanting to do that for a while. I actually floated that when we were making the Gallister twins, but it's a very kind of solitary background and it wouldn't very have worked much, for linked characters. Very much. The Gallister twins are are very much linked. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So much fun. I really oh hope gosh. we can try those two out someday. I still have yet to commission art. I'm going to commission yeah, art and I, then I we'll just, have like, to play We them. both came up with like these really like visually striking characters too because it's like yeah. they, they started off as tieflings and they're like, well, this is not good because mm-hmm. um, we thought we were just from a family of humans. Where's this infernal taint coming from? And from years of like working for these angels, they've kept all their physical features, but they've taken on kind of angelic appearances that mirror their patrons. And it's, yeah, yeah it's so, so mine is, is based on like cold and ice. And I've sort of tried to model my spell list after that as well. And Peter, you went with more of like a fire scorch kind of thing. Not even that so much as just like a, a very much like the black and white kind of a thing. It's like mm-hmm. all of the impurities in him are have been pushed to his extremities. So yeah. like the, the skin on his hands is is black, but like if you look at like his face or his arms or his torso, he looks like he's made out of like white marble almost. I had fun coming up with the descriptions of those characters. That was yeah. that was very cool. Very much. So how are we going to portray them? The angels, the not angels. the not the Gallister twins, because we've talked about them too much. So. Right. Yes, we have. Yeah. Well, we kind of talked about this briefly last episode, talking about having these otherworldly and awe-inspiring and terrifying angels. Certainly, I think, unless you've got something very friendly and, you know, I'm going to say cherubic, but in the worst sort of sense of the word. Um, yeah. <laughs> Puttyic. Putty, uh, puttyic. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> to horribly mix linguistic sources here. You need that moment of fear not. Yeah. yeah. And I'd also say that like otherworldly doesn't have to be grand and majestic. It can just be weird and unsettling. Sure. If you go that route, you don't necessarily have to do the fear not because there might legit be something to fear there. Um, a really good example of this, if you want to see a very good portrayal of an unsettling angel who is definitely good. And definitely doing good things, but is still just uncanny valley kind of stuff. I would actually recommend the Adventure Zone Dust campaign, which is only about five episodes, but you interact with this guy named Michael, who just talks with you very calmly, very smoothly. And he's a little bit too calm about certain things and in certain situations that other people are very uncomfortable in. And he's a mortician, and he's Michael the Archangel of Death. So... It's it's this this very you you go into this situation and you you don't necessarily know what's going to come out of the angel's mouth. You, you it's it's a sort of an unpredictability because they are just so far outside of the bounds of human experience. I love that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's very fun. You can also go with innocent and naive. Another good example of this is. Unsong, which is a book that's entirely done online. The book is sort of about, about what if the world were like very, very literally Kabbalistic and the angels portrayed there are very, very innocent and naive and just, uh, again, not quite human Mm -hmm. at all. So angels in this sense are not they, like they are not pure perfection. Angels aren't God. We know this. Right. But they have definitely not fallen. They have not been tainted by sin. Right. So and uh, another good source of this uh, in a slightly different direction, but very similar. Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman, their book Good uh, Omens. Good Omens. Yeah. Uh, yep. Which is, I believe, <clears throat> being uh, turned into a television series. It is with David Tennant in it. I know that David Tennant. Yeah. Is in so that I'm excited People about that. Very excited about that. I mean, the book is excellent, though. If you have not read it, pick it up, and you'll immediately understand why we all love both Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. Although I have not yet read Good Omens, I need to do it. I love them both, and I I've mean, read a Terry bunch Pratchett of their books. And Neil I just Gaiman. Read. Yeah, so, I mean, strong recommend, yeah. but that kind of goes without saying, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can also go the just, just good, just like really good and pure. Which it, I, I, I want to say, I want to clarify, it's different from innocence. Yes. 
because you can still be very good and very pure, but have seen stuff, <laughs> but just not allow yourself to be tainted or made to fall by that experience. This is kind of the default setting for a lot of the angels in Anamine, actually. Yeah. Particularly some of the, the archangels like Michael and David and Eli are, are all very kind of these wonderful, like benevolent figures, but who oh boy, have they seen some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, I watched the fall, okay? I'm yeah. still not okay about this. Mm -hmm. Sort of, I guess, the the other side of that, you can go, like, really cold and calculating and distanced. Yeah. Uh, and, and distanced because they don't want themselves to fall. They don't, they don't want to come into the world of sin. And so they step back and have a very hands-off kind of approach. Or when they do get involved in human affairs, it's very... Harsh harsh compassionless possibly destructive but very very calculating and cold and this ties into the occasional conceit of angels as divine constructs that you sometimes see mm -hmm. the being that is thinking and animate but doesn't really have free will in the same way that mortals do yeah yeah the almost robotic literal literal instrument of god's will yeah, and nothing else exactly when they're stern and unyielding and unreasoning lacking in empathy that's this sort of of angel i'm not mm -hmm. as fond of it but it does suit certain kinds of fiction and certain kinds yeah. of stories yeah this this often gets cited as an example of you know good is not nice or soft or weak but <sighs> You know, a little bit of real talk for me here. A lot of the time that trope is often actually portrayed as good as evil with a dollop of self-righteousness. Yeah. yeah. Um, goodness is not really goodness if it doesn't have a shred of mercy or compassion or empathy. And it's just no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I tend to agree. And there is also the implacable sort of angel. Fearless, perhaps a little disdainful of fear. Or sometimes you can also have the encouraging without fear. These are great if you want, like, angelic cavalry to come in and, like, save the day in some way, yeah. you know. You you hear, like, the trumpet from heaven and, like, the sky, you know, lights up and, like, this, you know, this host of angels comes swooping out and, you know, charges into the evil army of undead or whatever. And it's like, okay, you know, this is perfect for that kind of a scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a lot of potential for crossover with a naive angel here, because if you don't know what to fear, you're not going to fear it. You know, or if you're constructed in such a way where you really have nothing to fear, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. to once again, borrow from a nominee, you know, it's like if they're thinking, oh, the worst that's going to happen to me is my vessel's going to get hacked apart. I'm going to show up next to my heart in heaven. I'll be back in a day or two. No big. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, right. yeah. that's very different from somebody who's actually mortal, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One final note. Don't let all of the gaming stuff that we've mentioned inform your actual theology. There's a reason we took a little break to talk about real theology partway through. It's it's important to distinguish what Christians believe from what we can turn into a good game. Yeah. Now, you can certainly turn what we believe into a good game. I want to make that clear. But there's lots of certainly. other variations and, and dead ends that are cool stories but aren't theologically sound. So yeah. keep that in mind. What we believe can make a good game. What makes a good game is not necessarily what you should believe. Yeah. Yeah. So that's about it for me. I don't know. Do we have anything else on this? Um, I just found out that Erica Shepard, the person who designed Exodus, also has another game about angels. It's called Divinity, and it's, quote, about learning to love your body when your body is an immense heavily, heavenly machine of war. Okay. <laughs> okay. I am already intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to check that one out, too. Yeah. Um, Send that around to us, and we'll see if we can put that in the show notes, too. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thank you, folks. Really do appreciate it. If you like this episode and previous episodes... Take a minute to share this episode and others around on social media. That helps us a great deal. And take a minute to review us if you have not done so on iTunes or anywhere else you can review podcasts. That does help us quite a bit. It really does. Uh, and of course, if you want to support us on Patreon, get all sorts of interesting rewards, you can do that. And you can join our Discord to talk with us or, of course, follow us on Twitter. Yeah, the Discord does not require sponsoring us on Patreon. That is open to no, everybody. Yeah. Yes. So. Important to note. Anybody can join mm -hmm. and just come out and talk and hang out with uh, other listeners. It's a fun little community. Yeah. We're quite fond. 
We're, we're going to wrap this up here. Take it easy, folks. Have a good one. We'll <coughs> catch you next time. See, See you later, ya. folks. This has been a production of Saving the Game. All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share-alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilor.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.